That said, we're about to have a panel on politics. No, <laughs> no arguing, all right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is going to be a great panel. Um, people who's actively working and trying to change politics, <coughs> politics to further the solidarity economy's purpose and further cooperatives in America. We have some great um, speakers here. And that said, I'll be quiet. You guys have to listen to me a few more times today, and I'll pass it on to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Ooh, okay, sorry. I'm a school uh, teacher assistant, so let's do a little better. How's everybody doing? Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us today at today's panel. Uh, we have amazing speakers here, elected officials, uh, public policy advisors, uh, non-for-profit directors, and uh, really uh, hard-working organizers with DSA's as many working groups. So there's a lot of, uh, what you call it, uh, there's a wealth of information here. I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves a good, you know, two, three minutes. Uh, hopefully I don't have to get, take out a timer at any point. Uh, and uh, from here, let's start with Carlos. Carlos. Great. How y'all doing? Real good. Yeah. My name is Carlos Ramirez Rosa, and I'm proud to represent 55,000 working people from the northwest side of Chicago. It's all over to the 35th Ward. 35th Ward, thank you so much, takes in parts of five neighborhoods, Hermosa, Logan Square, Avondale, Irving Park, and Albany Park. And I was elected in 2015 on a pledge to make sure that City Hall prioritizes our neighborhoods and working families, not big and powerful corporations and special interests that give big campaign contributions to the politicians at City Hall. So my commitment is to ensure that we have participatory democracy in the 35th Ward, that we have a system where people are empowered to come together and make decisions in their collective self, in, in their collective interests. And ways that we sought to do this in the 35th Ward is by taking the things that an alderman has unilateral control over, for example, the allocation of $1.3 million in board infrastructure funds annually, uh, decision making around the zoning map amendments, uh, which is something that aldermen by practice have unilateral control over, and turning it over to the community um, through a robust, inclusive, transparent, uh, and participatory process where Ward residents, regardless of their education level attained, regardless of their immigration status, regardless of what language they dominate, are able to have a seat at the table and have a real meaningful say in the outcome of the decision that's made. So to me, this relates very closely um, to the work that you all do. Right? Because what you're doing is creating democratic institutions that empower people um, to have real power. Right? Where we don't have one boss telling us what to do. Right? And at the heart of that, I think, is truly um, what we all want, which is freedom. Right? Um, so uh, I'm really excited to be with you all here today. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Amara? I think we should. Thank you, Carlos. I'm very glad to be sitting next to you. Uh, my name is Amara Enya. I am, by profession, a public policy consultant. I'm also an organizer. I am a proud resident of the west side of Chicago, Garfield Park. Um, and I'm also running for mayor. As someone who has the experience of working at the top level of city government, so I've worked in an administration, but has also worked at the grassroots level organizing, I can't say how excited I am to be at this particular moment, in this particular time, in this city, where we are actually having a cooperative economy summit. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember the days years ago, uh, I might be dating myself, um, when talking about cooperatives was like yelling into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on this issue of cooperatives around the world for almost 20 years. Um, I studied in Spain, I studied in Italy, um, I'm African, so it was just a part of how we ordered our societies. And the question that kept coming up was, how do we reflect the democratic values that we talk about in the economy? How do we replicate the values that we all hold in the working world? How do we use these sorts of models to rebuild communities, to rebuild our city, um, and really to show an alternative of what is possible. And one of the most frustrating things about doing that work for, for so many years was because here there was a limitation on our imagination. There was a lot of um, 
just a lot of a cementing of the status quo as it relates to how we address some of the most pressing issues that we face in the city of Chicago. But the answers are there and the solutions are there. And so what this particular conference is evidence of is the fact that we have finally broken through and that this is something that is now on the radar, not only across the city, but across the state. I had the pleasure of working uh, in communities around these cooperative, around cooperative economic models. So I'm the founder of the Institute for Cooperative Economics and Economic Innovation. And the Institute was founded in part to really bring together the entire cooperative ecosystem to advance an, an education agenda where we're educating the public as well as our elected officials and those in policy making positions where we can provide technical assistance to assist those who want to start cooperatives in their communities, as well as those who want to convert existing businesses to cooperatives, and to develop a comprehensive policy and legislative agenda to create the infrastructure necessary for cooperative economic models to actually thrive, both in the city and the state. Um, in all of my work, this is something that I've been pushing very aggressively, and so it's very exciting to see uh, everything coming together, essentially. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and looking forward to uh, talking with my colleagues on the panel. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure, real pleasure being here with uh, great people, not only here in the panel, but around the room. Um, and I think that's what's going to take to change what we see today in the city, not only the city, but this is, uh, you know, some... Uh, phenomena that we see around the world. These are national, global trends that we see in terms of uh, the displacement of, of uh, thousands of residents, right? So I think um, myself included being displaced not only, you know, right now in the city, but also, you know, these are global trends I, as an immigrant, you know, that I came here to this country when I was 17 years old because of the dismantling a whole economy of neoliberalism and austerity measures that destroyed entire countries. Uh, today we see the, the consequences of those policies affecting millions of people, the same families that tried to cross the border and now they're separated from their own children. That's the, that's, that's, that's the atrocity, uh, the atrocities that we see uh, today and uh, that we have to face. And we have to reconcile all these contradictions, right? Where we have to see uh, what the policies around the world have created and how do we address them locally? Because here in our neighborhoods we see the same problems of displacement, of austerity, uh, of defunding, right? So, and how we are creative and innovative about doing this. So, uh, in my work, as uh, uh, I was uh, the former uh, director of the Wilson <coughs> Alliance, and I'm very proud of being, you know, a grassroots organizer and an educator, because I do think that that's from the grassroots when we see where the issues are and what the needs are of our communities. The working class people are hurt. There's a massive displacement. 250,000 black residents have been displaced from, from the city. In Pilsen alone, 10,000 residents have left. And those myths that displacement is inevitable, that there's nothing we can do about it, we have to challenge those myths. There are myths that we should not accept and should not tolerate. So in the work that we have been doing in the Pilsen Alliance, now we're changing the narrative. Today in Pilsen, because, not because we are the only ones working around this, but there's great people, residents that we're empowering to come to the table. Not too long ago, the, uh, PICO is a, is, a, is a cooperative that is being developed by residents in Pilsen. And not too long ago, like a month ago, we were able to facilitate a meeting with them and the city to talk about how a cooperative in Pilsen can be feasible and is very, very powerful. Now, what we saw was like the, how the city was so uncomfortable with that conversation, right? So we are not talking with us. That's a, that's, a, that's, that's a cooperative that has a lot of expertise, that has a lot of people behind them. There's not just people coming out of there, and we still don't have the political willingness to fund these kind of initiatives. So that's what I decided to step down, and I'm running for Alderman in the 25th world, because that's what we need to do in order to have the political um, I'd like to say, and then the introduction, because this is not the only initiative. This is, a, this is one of the many strategies that we need to continue to push at the ground level to make sure that they happen. There's so much money, we cannot accept that there's no money, that we're broke. They're not broke. They, well, the only time when we see a crisis is when the banks are starting to lose money. But when the people start to go homeless, there's no crisis. We do have a homeless crisis, a, a, a housing crisis in the city. And we gotta talk about housing as a human right. We gotta talk about cooperatives, not only for residents, for small businesses. And the other thing that we have been able to change at the grassroots level, now we're starting to talk about rent control. 
So those are the fights that we can win, and now we can see all the, you know, a lot of the, the, the politicians that before wouldn't touch this issue, now talking about how that can be a reality. And it's gonna be with people like in this room to make it happen. Collecting petitions, pushing politicians to make this a reality because a better world is not only possible, but it's necessary. Thank you. keep it brief. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ugo Okere. I'm a community organizer, uh, longtime resident of the 40th Ward, uh, uh, former chairman of community organization Fuente del Sol, a current member of Chicago Democratic Socialists of America, part of the housing working group and the electoral working group as well. Uh, I'm extremely excited to be here and to be on this panel and fighting and pushing for the work that you all are doing here today and have been doing for um, decades in time. And that's building a cooperative economy and that's building um, co-ops to be as strong as they possibly can. Uh, so I'm also running for Alderman of the 40th Ward. And, and on that campaign, I have tenets that primarily focus on co-governance and equity. These are values that I believe align straightly and perfectly with co-ops in, in, in the sense that, you know, in co-governance it's this idea that it's not me going into city council, but it's the entire ward going into city council. So creating that representative democracy where folks have a seat at the table and government in their hand through policies like the ones that Alderman Carlos Ramirez also already institutes in his ward, participatory budgeting, giving that $1.3 million worth of infrastructure funds over to the people to have democratic control on how they want to spend their taxpayer dollars. It's also about building community-driven zoning processes, making sure that residents have the ability to decide what kind of businesses and developments come into their neighborhoods and into their wards. Uh, the second part of our, our campaign is talking about equity, and that's making sure that we understand that equity and equality are the same things. It's about investing in places that need it the most. And when we see, uh, when we're talking about co-ops, that's exactly what, we're, what, we're, what I mean when I say equity. Over 60% of co-ops in the city of Chicago uh, are owned by women. The majority of them owned um, by black, uh, by black and brown folks and people of color. And so that means this city has uh, has the has a necessity to invest in these forms of economy. It is a true vehicle for the working class to be able to have upward economic mobility. Mm -hmm. So that means we can fight for things like community land trusts. That means that we can fight for things like regenerative uh, neighborhood developments. It's about making sure that we are democratizing every aspect of our, our lives, including in our workplaces, in our in, in our uh, you know in our, in our personal relationships, and in everything that uh, co-ops stand for. And so, um, I want to make sure that we have a city council that is fighting and making sure that we are not leaving co-ops to um, to j just to. We're not leaving them without help. We're not leaving them without the infrastructure that they, they need to succeed. You know, I was in, I was at the uh, Cook County Commission um, on Social Innovation. They had a, a, a meeting last week um, where a, a few folks, I think some of them were presenting today, and we're talking about the challenges that co-ops face um, in working in the city of Chicago and in the surrounding um, Chicago land area. Understanding that there is, you know, when it comes time to, for example, get uh, get capital um, to start up their um, co-ops, it's a struggle because banks don't know how to deal with them. Banks don't know they exist. Um, when it comes to um, laws on the books and governing how um, we approach um, co-ops, there's a lack of it in general. And so we need to make sure that we're building a city council that is fighting to make sure that we're investing in um, co-ops wherever we can. So um, I'm happy to be on this panel and I'm really excited to, um, to, to strategize and work with you all in building that cooperative economy. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing panel, as you guys can see. Uh, definitely people that are fired up. This seems like a very informed crowd on uh, workers' co-ops, food co-ops, and we will touch on, on land banks and what we can do. Uh, not to go right to it, but I want to start with municipal banking. It is a, it's a form of cooperative economy. I mean, once you're trying to change anything in the economy, people ask you, well, how are you going to pay for it? Uh, so uh, if I can start with bunting to uh, our expert on municipal banking. Uh, what would uh, this idea of collectivizing our, our financial needs to supplant a lot of this other programming, what would that look like at, um, in Chicago? So I, um, so I, it's, a, it's a very relevant question. Ugo just talked about some of the challenges uh, from a financial standpoint for supporting cooperative enterprises. One of the things that I really want to make clear is that the way that we move out of this position that we're in as a city is by transformative economic policies and proposals. 
That means that we cannot be tweaking around the edges of the current financial system, hoping that perhaps something will change for us. It means we cannot be uh, afraid to actually put forth bold ideas that actually work, that are transformative. And that means top to bottom. So it's grassroots level, but it's also at the very top of our financial system. And so the public bank or the municipal bank is something that I've been working on for years. I've drafted legislation on it. I'm part of a, a national leadership group called the Public Banking Institute, where we're actually pushing this in agenda for the governor-elect of New Jersey. Uh, there is now an effort in New York, uh, in Los Angeles, and across the country. The reason being that many of the issues that we're facing when it comes to this notion of whether or not the city is broke, for example, or there's no money for anything, at least when we come uh, with proposals, all of a sudden there's no money. <laughs> it is the fact that we actually spend so much of the money that we do have on things like bad bank deals. So if you've ever heard of toxic swaps, where you're essentially gambling with taxpayer dollars, hoping that the interest rate swap works out in your favor. And if it doesn't, that triggers hundreds of millions of dollars in fines automatically that we pay as a city. We have done this for years. It's also in infrastructure. So when we're redoing our roads, our, our roadways, our water system, those are that's billions of dollars that is being spent. Now if you think about the interest that you pay on a billion dollar project, the average overrun, cost overrun, is 50%. That is money that we never see. It is going solely to uh, traditional financial institutions because their allegiance is to the bottom line. It is to profit. Mm -hmm. The difference with a public bank is that their allegiance is to supporting the economy of the city in which they inhabit. That's right. <laughs> It is a paradigmatic shift in what a financial institution should do as it relates to the public. And so when you think about the money that we say that we don't have, think about how many millions of dollars and billions of dollars are now recirculated into our economy. And what can we do with that? We can use that money to fund our own infrastructure projects. We can use that money to issue our own low interest loans for small businesses and for cooperative enterprises. Right? We can develop our own financial products that support the growth of this sector in the city's economy. We can actually in issue home loans. These are the things that are actually in the interest of a strong economic ecosystem, but it starts with how we even perceive of the role of a financial institution <coughs> in public life. And we have to, if we want to transform, it, transform the economy, and if we want to move away from austerity, away from the 1% amassing more while communities are struggling and have to be happy when they get a few million dollars here or there sprinkled around at election time. We have to begin to put forth these kinds of bold solutions that are tried, tested, and true. The best model for a public bank is in the state of North Dakota. It is the highest performing, best performing bank in the country. It outperforms Wall Street banks year after year. So this is not something that has not been tested. It is not something that is that is uh, an unknown quality. It is something that is legitimate, and we have to have the will to do it. Once we have that in place, it creates the environment for us to now develop the tools necessary to support the cooperative infrastructure. So now we're addressing our financial issues at the very top. And then at the bottom, we have this cooperative infrastructure that's addressing issues of income inequality. It is addressing issues of wealth building and generational wealth building, because that is one of the roots of the problems that we're seeing in communities where displacement is happening. It is the fact that we don't have the wealth to own our homes, to own land, right? And our children don't have wealth to own homes, own land, own businesses. So it's a multi, it's, a, it's really a, it is addressing it from the top and the bottom, and we have to, if we're serious about changing the city, I think it has to be at the top of our agenda. Thank you. Process to this, so I wanted to go uh, next step to the process of this. It seems like we have we need a lot of support from on top, um, a lot of uh, things to be done there. But at the local level, what process do you have for using your office for community engagement? I want to ask Carlos about his work with participatory budgeting and what he could see himself expanding on if these things were to happen. Absolutely. Um, I just want to add something quickly uh, to what uh, Amara shared with us, and that is that the city of Chicago and its sister agency, <coughs> at any given time assets in the bank in pension funds have $80 billion. Yes. So I mean, CHA, CTA, CPS, Park District, the city of Chicago as a corporation, at any given moment, $80 billion. 
And when you go to the bank and you pay fees, right, to use your bank account, right, um, just imagine the amount that we're paying in fees um, to put that money in bank with the big Wall Street banks. I mean, literally tens of millions of dollars in fees are being turned over to Wall Street simply for them to make a profit off of our money, right? So um, the mayor in the city of Chicago appointing the boards of the sister agencies has enormous power to be able to compel those agencies to join into a municipal bank and be able to leverage those $80 billion to work for us and not the Wall Street banks. So it's definitely feasible. It only takes the political courage to say we're gonna break with Wall Street. But one of the things we also have to understand is that there's a revolving door Mm -hmm. between municipal governments and finance. So the same people that are selling us these bad financial instruments are then the ones that are coming into the positions as our chief financial officer and telling us to enter into even more uh, bad uh, financial uh, debt instruments. Now, to answer your question. Um, <laughs> so uh, the position of Alderman is very unique um, in that uh, there's a lot of things that you control unilaterally. And one of the things that you also control unilaterally that we haven't touched upon yet is how the city uh, deals with publicly owned land in your ward. So for example, if there are city owned lots in your ward, the city will not move forward with selling that piece of land without first checking in with the alderman. Mm -hmm. So that could take different forms. It could take the form of an RFP. Right, where the Department of Planning and Development and the local aldermen work together alongside community groups to come up with a request for proposals. And they say, we are looking to sell this piece of land to a developer uh, that meets these requirements, Right, that's gonna use this land for X, Y, Z, or the other. The other way that uh, you can sell a piece of land is through a brokered sale. Um, and this actually gives the least local control to the community and to the local elected official. Why? Because that means that a bunch of pieces of land are gonna go up for sale at the same exact time and the zoning that it has when it goes up for sale is the zoning that has to remain with that lot. So uh, you don't know who's gonna buy it, uh, you don't necessarily know what they're planning to do with it, but once they buy it, it's theirs, and the zoning that it has uh, that's with that lot is the zoning that they get to use and build to as of right. The final form that you can uh, sell a piece of land is a negotiated sale. And that means that the city will literally enter into an agreement with one entity and decide that they're going to sell that piece of land with that entity. So they're not gonna go through the RFP process, they're just gonna deal one-on-one. -on -one. And that's something uh, that can be used to sell a piece of land for one dollar, mm -hmm. right? So for example, if you are, you shake your hand like, don't sell that piece of land for one dollar. <laughs> but, um, you know, right now, for example, uh, the federal government and city government is not really in the business of building affordable housing. Mm -hmm. All of that money is given over to uh, either for-profit or non-profit affordable housing developers. So for a non-profit affordable housing developer, it can be very difficult, particularly in gentrified neighborhoods, to be able to bring together the capital necessary to purchase a piece of land that in some instances can be worth three, four, or five million dollars, right? So the only way that you're gonna be able to use that lot for affordable housing in many instances is if you do a negotiated sale for one dollar with a nonprofit affordable housing developer. So that's one way that an alderman can leverage the power that they have to deliver on things like affordable housing, or it doesn't even have to be affordable housing, right? It could be to use that piece of land for a community garden. It could be to use that piece of land for some type of cooperative economy purpose, whether they're going to do some light industry there. Um, that's one way that aldermen can use their position to support uh, a cooperative economy. But the other way as well, and I think that this is extremely important to talk about, is um, what uh, Ugo talked uh, on earlier and what I touched on earlier, which is uh, zoning and development. So in the city of Chicago, every single alderman has unilateral control over zoning and development. Um, and uh, they control the zoning of amendments uh, that occur in their ward. And generally what we have found in the city of Chicago is that if you can make a big campaign contribution to the alderman, uh, you can probably get whatever type of zoning it is that you want. Um, so I really think that it's extremely important uh, that in your own community you assess what can be built where based upon the existing zoning map. And you then proactively reach out to your local elected official and ask them in many instances to lower that zoning. So for example, McKinley Park, the asphalt plant, across the street from the park itself next to a school, right? That did not require a zoning change, right? It was built as of right, right? But if the alderman had proactively said, you know what, maybe we should reclassify this zoning 
to limit the types of uh, you know po polluting industries that can go into this area, then had the asphalt plant wanted to locate there, they would have needed a zoning change, right? Mm -hmm. And in the context of a community-driven process, that then empowers the community to have a real say over what that looks like. Mm -hmm. One example of uh, how we have been able to uh, use uh, zoning map amendments coupled with the community-driven process to lead to a better collective uh, economy is uh, with the development of a uh, boutique hotel on Milwaukee Avenue in Logan Square, adjacent to the Logan Square Blue Line stop. So there is a uh, old warehouse building that has been empty for many, many years. Some of you might know it as the Grace's Furniture Building, used, used as a furniture store. And um, when I took office, I downzoned uh, that lot, and then the developer comes up to me and says, hey, guess what? I want to build luxury housing there. Now, they didn't realize that I had downzoned the lot. Um, <laughs> So they thought that they still had the ability to build that luxury housing as of right. And I said, well, if you want to build uh, you know, luxury housing there, then we're going to have to have a conversation about affordability and the amount of affordability that you're going to include on site. And they said, oh, no, well, we don't want to have that conversation. Um, and that was the juncture at which the notion of a uh, hotel was floating, right? And because they needed to go through a zoning change to get that hotel, we were able to get them to work closely with Logan Square Neighborhood Association, with Logan Square Preservation, and with other stakeholders in the community. And over a two year long process, the community collectively with the developer and the hotel operator came out with a proposal that everyone was on board with. So it wasn't just those that were bringing the capital to the table making all the decisions unilaterally. Because of the community driven process, they had to enter into a serious relationship with community stakeholders and engage in a robust conversation about what that proposal looked like. That is a cooperative economy. Um, and the end result that we got was uh, a community benefits agreement which ensures local hiring, upwards of 75% of the individuals that are gonna work at that hotel and at the restaurants there need to be hired locally. It delivered a $15 living wage for those workers it also ensures that those workers are going to have the ability to learn about their right to unionize uh, as they uh, are onboarded into uh, the uh, hotel and to the restaurant. Um, but what it also delivered was a beautiful building uh, that is unlike normally the type of cheap stuff that developers like to build. Uh, <laughs> you know, have you all just drive around the city, and this is the last thing I'll say on this question because I know more work. Look at the buildings and look at all the white, like, stains on the building, that is because the water is seeping in through the brick and it's evaporating and those are deposits that are appearing on that uh, building. So it's endemic, you see it all over in Wicker Park, you see it all over where they have a lot of new construction, uh, but because we were able to work with the developer, uh, those individuals that were part of our community process that have a lot of knowledge around architecture and design, um, we're able to put together a proposal that's going to stand the test of time and isn't just there so that someone can make a quick buck and then walk away from the community and leave mm. us holding the bag for the next hundred years. That's yes. right. Local groups. Uh, when developers give large donations to an alderman, they tend to get the land use that they want. Okay. Want to pivot with that <laughs> uh, to a gentrifying community uh, that I do uh, work in, and uh, you know there is a history in Pilsen of uh, of kind of public housing, and you know the legacy of Casa Slan, and uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, big developments. Uh, the Urban Lad Institute just led a charrette. Um, describing about what was possible in Pilsen. Um, I, Byron, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, no, and, and I think to, to speak into the point that Mara and Carlos have made in terms of like the importance of allocating public res resources for the public, right? And I think for, you know, for way too long, I think we've seen public funds actually being allocated to push private projects and luxury projects even, which is more concerning, right? So I think in Pilsen, and I mean, this is not unique to the Pilsen communities, across, I mean, across the world, across the city, what we see is less and less, you know, investment in affordable housing as, as a whole. We do see that the places in, in, in our community, and which has a strong legacy in terms of um, community benefits agreements and pushing back in terms of what we can negotiate. But even then, in the Pilsen community, we have uh, an affordable minimum requirement of 21% for new projects. 
um, in the you know since 2006, we haven't been able to develop one single project, right? But in the cases when these projects have gone forward, right, in other communities nearby in the same ward, developers have paid in lieu fees to get away with this, right? Yeah. This money today until today is unaccounted for. Nobody knows. In the 25th ward alone, is like 3.5 million dollars, I believe. In a community where we have a shortage of affordable housing, how is it possible that we cannot invest in affordable housing and yet still the city had the audacity to spend recently, I think Jose alluded to this, $135,000 for consultants to push for uh, as luxury development for 495 units in Pilsen. How is it possible, how can we do with $135,000 that, by the way, they came to tell us the same thing that we already knew, right? That we needed uh, uh, CBAs, right? We needed a land bank, that we needed to enforce the 21%, and that that's the only way that we are able to preserve a community like Pilsen and actually start building communities that are more inclusive and actually change the horrible legacy you have on segregation. Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna do it by investing in affordable housing. So we can have policies like the 21%, but if we don't have the political willingness we cannot enforce it, we cannot, and this money, where does it go? So we don't have, we don't have instruments, or we don't have like a municipal bank would be fantastic to channel this, this uh, you know, just in one, one community alone, you know, uh, over $3 million, that should go back because they paid fees to avoid afford the affordable housing requirement. This, this, is a, this is not radical, nothing radical about this. This is, this is the law, but the mayor doesn't follow it. Obviously, those who get paid by the same developers through their campaign contributions don't follow it. And that's the consequences that we see. Now, I'll give you another example. In, in Casa Slam, right? Casa Slam was a historic, uh, um, where actually Pilsen Alliance used to be, a uh, community center. We lost this community center, but we not only lost this community center, we got luxury housing, right? That, that's, what, that's what happened. That's between when, when a few transactions were made, eventually landed with a, a developer, city paths. Right? And I do think it's important to, to name them because these are the same developers that were victim people in SRO in Uptown. These are the same developers. So when we talk about like, people talk about invisible hands or the free markets, I see very visible hands, you know? And I don't see any free market here. So, so, so I do, I do you know, so these developers, come to the community, and instead of following the, the minimum requirements, right, they find a very easy way to get away with it. And it's very clear, and we should know how they operate, right? $10,000 for, for, for Rami and I know in campaign contributions, and a little kickback for the other one. That's how they operate, yeah. Yeah. right? So when we wanna go back and we say, hey, you know what happened with the 21%, right? Now, this is the same developer, and I would like to make sure that they are held accountable because this is the same developer who erased an historic mural in this building, right? And in the social media, had the audacity to say, making Chicago great again. <laughs> now, that's the kind of developer that comes in our community. These are not, these, these are not uh, do-gooders. They are not people mm. who are actually following the law. Right. These are people, and I think their license has recently been suspended. But this is the kind of developers that are building more and more and get political favors across the city. Yeah. Up, down, Pilsen, Humboldt Park, Logan Square. You know, we see them, we see them, we know the names very clearly. So we need to put a stop to this, right? If we are able to continue to this affordable housing. In fact, you know, it's, with a political willingness, we can go farther than that. Because when we hold them accountable, immediately they say, okay, well, we can create a land bank, right? But to create a land bank, we need the political willingness and the instruct, you know, the, the, the institutions to make it happen. And they know that they don't exist, so they get away with it. So what, what we'd like to end with, I don't want to extend, but it's important that we, we are very clear what we're demanding because these developers have the resources to invest in co-ops, to invest in, in, a, in a land bank. In fact, the, 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 these developers have said, yeah, there's no problem. But if they're not pushed, they will not do it because they don't, they don't believe in a, in a, in a community that, that is trying to create a vision where everybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. Right? We see it in the locals, right? They're making Chicago great again. That's what they believe in. That's what the developers, and there are no difference between who that they fund. They fund those who allow them to do these atrocities right. in our communities. So that's what we need to fight, and that's why electoral politics is so important. Because we can, you know, organizing, and I'm a firm believer of organizing. 
you know, but we need to take it farther because the representatives who make these decisions happen are those people who actually get the contributions and behind doors are screen our communities. So to support cooperatives, land bank, business, small businesses, we need public resources, you know? We cannot be, TIF dollars is another thing, you know? TIF dollars should not be funding private stadiums, you know, when we start getting our own schools or public school being defunded. On a, on, on, a, on a yearly basis, you know? In this, in this year alone, you know, we needed, you know, millions of dollars of repairs, we only got one million, I believe. Well, we have almost 100 million sitting on the team. These decisions are criminal, you know? Because it hurts kids, you know? So, I, I would like to end, you know, with the, with the fact that the consequences that can be, right? Homelessness have consequences, right? And I would like to share the last story, right? We knew a family who ended up living in a car for months, right? Until and, and then one of the one of one of them was diabetic, the complications went apart that the husband lost his life because you know the complications of being in the cold, in a car. Now that's the consequences we, you know of what we see of the you know when we talk about housing as a human right, we mean it, you know. So that's why it's important that we fight back. That those stories don't become the norm, and we see more changes in our communities. So please, you know, I, my my my. Uh, you know, my pledge to you is, you know, my, and my, my, uh, my ask of you is to get involved because this story should not be accepted. Thank you. Really brief on uh, gentrification in um, North Central Chicago. I was about to tee you up with a question, oh. but you can just take it away. Go ahead. <laughs> well, was, eh, hold on. Um, so I wanted to take a very quick moment to just talk about gentrification in, in, the, in the 40th Ward specifically. So a lot of folks think that you know because it's a majority white uh, community, and as well as m many um, uh, neighbors in the North Side of Chicago, that we're not experiencing gentrification. We in fact are. Uh, so, for example, in the Andersonville community in, in my ward, it's a high density uh, neighborhood and it used to be home to a lot of working class folks. Uh, as time has gone on, folks um, who live in the 40th ward know that the alderman's wife is a real estate broker in the ward. And aldermen in the city of Chicago have a ridiculous amount of power when it comes to zoning um, privileges. And in that sense, she has been able to sell $22 million worth of homes in the ward because of his, all of his zoning privileges. That wouldn't happen if we didn't have, if we were able to flush out corruption in the city of Chicago and the, the, the aldermen in the city. If we had a community-driven zoning process that allowed people to see the kinds of deals that are being made on the back end in city council and in these aldermanic offices, this wouldn't have happened. There are 100 units of affordable housing in the 40th Ward, 100 units as a whole, with it, all 55,000 residents that live there, 100 units, 80 of them are for seniors. That's great, we have affordable housing for seniors. What about working class families that need a place to live in the 40th floor? What about young folks who are looking for a place to live and can't find it? We are, we are strategically creating a place, a ward where we cannot, where we're not allowed to have working people, we're not allowed to have people of color because we, we're not investing in the things that they need. You know, you know it's, it, and this is how, this is where it's extremely frustrating because when you're knocking doors and you're talking to people, you're going up to these apartment complexes that have 100 units in them, and then as you're knocking the doors, you're like, where is everybody? No one's home. And then I got into, I got into one apartment complex, and someone had told me, uh, yeah, the, the landlord just raised rents so much that all about, like, we only have a quarter of the people that were living here, living here now. And so to me, if we didn't have if we actually had aldermen that were fighting back against developers that are here to, to, to raise rents and push people out, if we had aldermen that were here fighting for rent control in the city of Chicago and across the state of Illinois, we would be able to live in a community where we're not seeing working class folks being pushed out, we're not seeing people of color being pushed out. So the, the issue of gentrification is not just a south and west side issue, it's a north side issue as well. And we need to make sure that we're electing folks that care about the entire city and care about making sure that working class folks have a home no matter where they live in the city of Chicago. Thank you. One more question. I think it's important to name the alderman. Uh, Pat O'Connor, right? He's, yes, he's uh, I think, next to Ed Burke, he's maybe our second longest serving alderman. 35 uh, years. 35 years. Uh, you know, Ed Burke's wife sits on the Supreme, state Supreme Court. Uh, Pat O'Connor's wife seems to be making bank off his ward. Uh, this speaks a lot to the legacy of Chicago. I know it was one of the reasons you got involved with DSA and. Uh, you know what? Uh, what you think as an organizer turned, uh, you know, political office? What What was the, the motivating factor for you to go out and speak to people about these issues door to door? Oh gosh, um, 
It was, it was a multitude of things. Um, I think uh, one of it was definitely understanding the housing situation in the city of Chicago. Um, I spent a lot of time in the, in the housing working group in DSA and seeing the kinds of um, policies that um, the, the DSA wanted to push forward, whether it was making sure that you have a just eviction ordinance in the city so that, um, that, so that landlords can't just raise rents to push people out, like I was talking about earlier when I was knocking doors. Um, the adjusted eviction ordinance would have things like making sure that um, you know landlords can't kick people out um, just so they can uh, so they can they can like upgrade the building and develop it and increase rents um, to to astronomical amounts. They can't just um, they. I'm sorry. Sorry, the just cause uh, ordinance. That yes. They, uh, justified costs to yes. pick someone up. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so it would be things like. Uh, you know, multitude of, multitude of times disturbing the peace and, and, and things like that. But just having a set of reasons that someone can be evicted and not it being for the sole sake of profit on behalf of a developer or on behalf of a landlord. Um, it, it was also about making, it was also about understanding the place that the city of Chicago is in um, at this current moment with, uh, you know, us realizing that the city of Chicago's public school system is not only segregated by race, but also by class. And that leads yeah. to ridiculous amounts of funding disparities, whether you're a black and brown kid on the south side of Chicago or you're a white kid on the north side of Chicago. It's about, it was about understanding that you know, the debts and obligations in the city are balanced on the backs of marginalized people. Whenever it's time, whenever it's time to, to see, whenever we see that we have a budget shortfall, the mayor decides, you know what we're going to do? We're going to raise property taxes. You know what we're going to do? We're going to add another regressive tax to make sure that um, we're spreading the burden of taxation equally. Um, rather than making sure that we're um, taxing the folks who have been avoiding taxes in this city for the longest time, the wealthy, the top one percent. Um, it, it's also about. It's, I also got in the race because I recognize that. The black and brown residents of the city are fearful of the Chicago Police Department, and they should not be. Yeah. I, as, a, as a black man myself, and knowing that one in three um, uh, you know, black men end up in jail, I, I knew that we, we, I could not continue to sit on the sidelines or, or you know, continue to do what I was doing um, and not putting my, putting my foot in the game, not putting a stake in the game and, and running for office myself, because I knew that we needed to make sure that we had all the men across the city that understood the, 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 the way that the economy was not working for average working people. We needed, um, we needed all the men that understood that uh, black and brown people are um, fleeing the city in droves because they can't afford to live here and because they're um, scared to live here. Uh, so, it, all those. All those <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to let our panelists close out with closing thoughts about their race. And anything else you want to add on? Uh, time went really fast. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for questions. Uh, maybe five minutes, but I'm going to let the panelists close and then uh, we'll take questions. Byron, if you want to go next up to Uber. And I feel like I talk a lot. That's it. So I'm going to um, try to be brief. But uh, I think that what, that what motivated me to, to run again, because last time I, when I ran um, three years ago, four years ago, um, we saw what people power can do against, you know, money power. And we were 70 votes short of the runoff, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I, I honestly don't think that we will know what we're doing, you know. I just thought that we were like, we were fed up, you know. And just to have like this, that energy now, obviously we've been working in the community for like a decade and we, we see what's happening, you know. We, and we see the disconnection between the city hall and, and, uh, and our community that is dismantling us, literally dismantling our community. So we, it's the urgent issue where everybody is welcome, you know. Not only those who can pay for campaign donations, or, those who need, you know, um, favors from the city, but everybody, you know. So we com we can build communities that are truly inclusive and that truly represent the values of the working people. So I did think like we we seen like for instance one of just one example of what what is possible. I think in Pilsen, unfortunately, in other communities, you know, we are we have issues that are historic. Unfortunately, in a community like Pilsen, where we have a zoning that is RT4, for instance, where people. Com uh, Developers can come in and tear down buildings, entire buildings, and that's what we've seen. And then just build more luxury condos. And we have no protection, no way to, to, to generate protections for families. We can downzone all that, you know? And we can, for, you know, we can force conversations like, like Carlos has done in his, in his work to make sure that the community is at the table and is informed about what's happening. Because that ultimately affects their assessments and as, right now, and also it can generate more affordable housing. So we need to have those conversations. Again, nothing radical about that. We can generate these developers and we can push them to allocate those resources into pushing for a cooperative, 
carpet is a pico, and I would like to just, just because I need, they need a shout out. I know a good friend Ryan is now here, I'm gonna give a shout out because the regular people like him were making you know, this, uh, this happen. It's pico, it's P-I-H-C-O, is a, a cooperative in Pilsen that needs your support. You know, to make sure they be they, they have an organization we have, you know, we're pushing to have the have the structure that need political willingness to fund it. So, you know, those are those are the kind of things that we need, we need to, to fund and we know it's possible. I see across the world that people want change. And we have a we can make it happen. We can create affordable housing. You know, CHA has over two hundred million dollars just sitting there, you know, and we need to prevent more homelessness that is in the streets. So um, that's that's what motivates not only housing, but we see the same with education, the toxic swaps. You know that disinvesting in our community, in our schools, we need to elect the representative school board. There's so many things that we need, and we're gonna make it happen. You know? so I would like to say, if I say like, si se puede. That's what I'd like to say. You know, si se puede. Si se pudo last time, and this time we will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. I think that. Um, I think that it is important for us to put this entire election season in context. Um, because it's far bigger than one person. It's really not about me. It's about the future of the city. And because of how Chicago is situated on the national and global scale, it is about the future of this country and the future of the direction of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't want us to be in this space and, and just think about very locally, um, because this is so much bigger than that. What we're talking about are possibilities. And the question is what we're willing to do to create those possibilities and make them a reality. I spent most of the last time that I ran convincing people that the status quo can actually be changed. I spent most of my campaigning not talking about me and who I was, but about talking about how you can chip away at that sense of inevitability about the way things are, and about imagination, and the fact that what you can imagine you can actually create. That's what I talked about. The reason why that's so important is because every system that we're living in was created by a person or people who imagined it. Mm -hmm. And so the same way we live in a city that is guided by privatization, that is guided by contributions of the wealthy who are politically connected, that is guided by mores of greed and corruption, is the same way that we can actually create an alternative that's driven by the values that we hold, values of equity, values of justice, Values of fairness, values of an inclusive city that actually values all of its neighborhoods, not just those who can afford to live here now. Those are possibilities. And because there are those of us in this room and outside of this room who have committed ourselves to fighting to actualize those possibilities, it's brought us to this moment. So the decision that we have to make is what we're willing to do to create that alternative. Mm -hmm. We all know the problems. I don't have to spout them out. We know what's happening in education. We know what's happening in police, with police accountability. We know what's happening in our neighborhoods with economic disinvestment. I don't, I don't really spend a lot of time talking about the problems because I think about what the solutions are. And our energy is more better spent constructing the alternative vision that we have and making it real. And it's important that we do that. Mm -hmm. Because in our doing that, we actually liberate other people to see that vision and to create for themselves. Mm -hmm. We're not looking for handouts. I'm not begging anyone <laughs> for anything. Because by right of living here on the west side of Chicago, I have the right to the kind of quality of life that I believe I deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like when people in neighborhoods that have been overlooked feel that same way? There's certain things that we don't accept. So I won't accept that you can spend $55 million on a stadium 
and be happy doling out $25,000 to this small business or that small business. I don't accept that preface. I want to accept the fact that our pension obligations will mean that for us, our schools will have to be closed, our teachers will have to be displaced or fired, that we don't have the notion that we can actually invest in community infrastructure that reduces violence naturally, as opposed to investing in police infrastructure. There's certain things that you just don't accept. So we're here talking about cooperatives. This is not a niche thing. This is not a hobby. This is not something cute that we're just doing to pass the time. It is the future. It's the future of our city. It is the future of the economy that we hope for. It's the future for our kids. So my role in this is simply to amplify that vision and to hopefully use the power of the executive to actualize that vision. You know, I'm a democratic socialist and socialists, um, often talk about the future is socialism or barbarism. And I think that in this moment in time, locally, nationally, and internationally, we see that more than ever. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to tackle climate change? Are we going to tackle the poverty in this world? Are we going to tackle the six mass extinction that we're living through? Are we going to tackle all the crises that are bubbling up and occurring all across this planet collectively? making decisions democratically in our collective best interests? Or are we going to veer towards barbarism? An authoritarian future where we build walls, where we put each other in cages, where we hoard wealth, and we continue to ensure that we have a world where the few live in the ultimate lap of luxury with more money than they're ever gonna be able to spend in their entire lives. That's really the question that's before us. And we see this dichotomy in many different ways. Here in the city of Chicago, we see it in securitization. How many of y'all have heard that word securitization? That is one of the greatest things that we need to be very fearful about and tackle in this upcoming mayoral election. Because quite literally what the mayor of the city of Chicago and the banks want to do is turn over our revenue, our public dollars, to Wall Street and create a contract where we cannot decide what to do with those funds. We already did it with our sales tax dollars. So quite literally, our sales tax dollars, rather than going to our public budget, are diverted to a separate corporation that legally can only pay debt to Wall Street. Can legally only service debt to Wall Street. That means that if something happens and suddenly we want to reprioritize our city's budget, guess what? We can't touch that sales tax money. That belongs to Wall Street now. Now the mayor is proposing additional securitization, meaning that if the economy goes to shit and suddenly the city sees its revenue drop as it relates to property taxes, everything has to be slushed because that revenue that the city collects has to legally continue to service that debt for Wall Street. Now, as alderman, I've sought to replicate the world where we build socialism from below where we show people the ability to have a real voice and to make decisions collectively as it relates to zoning, as it relates to participatory budgeting, as it relates to the policies being set forth in the world. You all as individuals that are building the corporate economy are showing individuals their ability to do that same exact thing as it relates to their labor, as it relates to their generative, creative ability and capacity to produce. That is a very threatening thing to the powers that because they don't want us to have more say over our public dollars through participatory budgeting. They want the exact opposite of that. They want to lock our public dollars into contracts where quite literally we no longer have any type of say over how that money is spent. They don't want us to be able to go and negotiate with developers to get the best deal for our community. They want to maintain the status quo where developers are able to just cut a check to the individual that's in office and get whatever they want. Think about that. Even just that little concession 
The fact that in the 35th Ward, developers have to go through a community-driven process that really results in a better outcome for everybody. They're so threatened by that right now that they've recruited a candidate to run against me and they're gonna throw all the money in the world to back her up. Even that little tiny concession is entirely too much for me. And I even see in the 35th Ward where constituents tell me, but Alderman, I don't wanna to go to the zoning meeting. Alderman, I elected you to make the decision for me. I elected you to be a caldillo. I elected you to be a duche. <laughs> they don't say El Duce exactly, but that's essentially, that's essentially at the heart of what they're saying, right? And so that is why I'm so happy to see all of you here together. Because through your progress, through the different ways that you pursue a cooperative economy, you're switching that dichotomy on its head. And you're teaching people that they can have a real say, that they can have a real voice, that we don't need a Donald Trump, that we don't need a Rob Emanuel, that we don't need a Bruce Rauner, that we don't need a Bezos telling us what to do. Collectively, cooperatively, we can make those decisions for ourselves. So keep up the good work, and together we're gonna to change this world. Thank you so much.